Hello everyone, I'm Leah Alcor and from the University of Ottawa's International and Global Health Office and I'd like to welcome you to the first Global Health Learning Network event for this academic year 2023-2024. Uh, please note that the session uh, will be recorded. Before we begin, we pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. We acknowledge their longstanding relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. We pay respect to all indigenous people in this region from all nations across Canada who call Ottawa home. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. Uh, allow me to introduce you to the Global Health Learning Network. The Global Health Learning Network series is a collaboration between the School of Epidemiology and Public Health, the Bruyere Research Institute, the WHO Collaborating Center for Knowledge Translation and Health Technology Assessment and Health Equity, and the International and Global Health Office. This event is an accredited group health Group Learning Activity Section 1, as defined by the Maintenance of Certification Program of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada, and approved by the University of Ottawa's Office of Continuing Professional Development, you may claim a maximum of three hours. Credits are automatically calculated. This one credit per hour group learning program meets the certification criteria of the College of Family Physicians of Canada and has been certified by the University of Ottawa's Office of Continuing Development to three main We have the pleasure today to welcome our speakers today, Dr. Lala Soavina Roma Zoratovo and Dr. Trinidad Rodriguez and our moderator, Dr. David Paul. Dr. Lala Soavino Roma Zoratovo is Professor of Dermatology and Social Specialist in Internal Medicine the Faculty of Medicine of the Madagascar. She is current vice dean in charge of reform and accreditation in this faculty and head of department of special pavilion A, dermatology and internal medicine, Befalatana Hospital, former president of the Madagascar Society of Dermatology, Somadir. Uh, she is also member of other national and international scientific societies. Her research focuses on deep cutaneous mucosis, including chromomycosis, and sporotrichosis, and leprosy in Madagascar since 2012. She has been appointed as a GAFI Global Action Fund for Fungal Infection Ambassador at the WHO since 2018, author and co-author of more than 70 scientific publications. Dr. Trinidad Rodriguez Infante, is a family physician from the Catholic University in Chile. She holds a diploma in public policies at the same institution, is a medical education research fellow at the Besrur Center, and her research interests are in the area of early child development, infant mental health, and implementation science. She is a clinical assistant professor at the Faculty of Medicine Department and is in charge of childhood projects area at Ankara UC Health Innovation Unit. And finally, I'd like to welcome our moderator for today, Dr. David Ponka. Uh, he's the director of the Besrur Center for Global Family Medicine at the College of Family Physicians of Canada. He has also served as the Besrur Center Research Director and the chair of the Besrur Center Advisory Council, a family doctor in Ottawa, where he's a professor at the Faculty of Medicine. He has extensive experience in caring for vulnerable migrant populations in Canada and abroad nations such as Haiti, Chad, and Guyana, where he tries to support integrating research into the new discipline of family medicine. He has served as medical advisor to Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada, and is a member of the World Health Organization for Creating Center for Knowledge Translation and Health Technology Assessment in Health Equity. He earned his medical degree from McGill, hold the CCFP and FCPFP, and has a Master's of Science degree in International Primary Care from the University of London. He enjoys raising his three young girls in Ottawa to think and act as global citizens. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, David. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Lea, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, we see uh, 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 a logo. This is my land acknowledgement as well. I want to thank uh, all of the audience, the speakers for joining. It's a real treat to tell you about our fellowship program at the Besser Center for Global Family Medicine at the College of Family Physicians of Canada. We are always encouraged to give a personal land acknowledgement, and this is mine. Leah mentioned my three daughters. My wife works at the National Gallery. This is their new logo. 
and uh, it's borrowed from the Algonquin. It's a logo that stands for Ankose. Everything is connected. And in this time of post-COVID, climate change, COVID-19, cost of living, conflict, we are reminded that the Algonquin were and are right. And at the Besser Center for Family Medicine, we also realize that every one of us is connected. And the beauty of these rounds is the interdisciplinarity. So it's a real treat for me to present both our first two fellows. I was thinking that Trinidad, you could go first uh, because Lala, Prof Lala, Jenny wants to join us in about 20 minutes and wanted to hear your presentation. On peut prendre des questions en français. Prof Lala va parler en français, mais va montrer des diapositives en anglais. The Besser Center is only successful because of all of us. It's a tripartite relationship that makes the link between Canadian universities and their overseas partners and leverages our actions. Uh, I think we can all agree that none of us have sufficient resources, especially post-pandemic, to do the work we want to do. So it's all about collaboration. And we really are pleased that our first MOU with a Canadian university is the University of Ottawa. Again, there's a lot of shared knowledge around interdisciplinarity, and you'll see that through our two fellow presentations. This is uh, a little snapshot of our reach around the world uh, from a study we call FMVAX, the role of primary care in collaborating with public health and delivering COVID-19 vaccinations. We are involved in over 40 countries. And again, the Algonquin were right. We are all connected. Only 30% of people in low-income countries this morning, 32.8, have received even one dose of COVID-19 vaccine. That's a travesty. It's short-sighted. And it's dangerous because there is a natural human reaction towards parochialism and looking after one's closest communities during times of crisis. We are all here because we think that global learning, co-learning, in fact, learning from others, is the way forward. These, this is the preliminary results of FMVAX that I just wanted to mention before ceding the floor to first Trini and then Prof Lala. We can see that low, middle, and upper middle income countries can teach us a lot about integrated ways of thinking. The steepness of the slope represents the integration between primary care and public health. We have some degree of integration in high income countries, but not as steep as especially upper middle income countries, places like um, Malaysia, places like Indonesia. I'll also note that of the high income countries, Chile was the most integrated. And so Dr. Trinidad will tell us more about some of that and her project around childhood development. My last point is around capacity building and this is a paper we published uh, that shows that multiple layers of supervision, again, one step at a time is the way to go. And it's no accident that our two fellows uh, share many interests and that Trinidad is very interested in helping the next fellows along. It's also so important to create communities of practice, which is why these rounds are so important. And really to get rid of the artificial barriers between disciplines, including between clinicians and researchers. So with that said, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen. And if it's all right, uh, Trinidad, if you could start, we look forward to uh, sharing some lessons mm -hmm. from both our fellows. And these are rounds, so interrupt us anytime in either language. Thank you very much. So oh, I'm gonna share my screen, thanks David. Um, so here it is. So, um, good evening, at least until it's uh, 3 p.m. <laughs> um, how are you, everyone? Um, I'm going to show you um, the, the stuff I've been working for the last, uh, I don't know, three, four years with the pandemic in between. Um, it's a capacity building initiative in primary care. And um, I'm going to talk to you about the design, implementation, and evaluation of a training program for maternal and child health workers, uh, which is still a work in progress because um, this um, training program is ongoing. Uh, it's part of a 
a biggest in, bigger initiative uh, which uh, aims to change uh, the model of care uh, in in terms of uh, what we are offering nowadays to uh, pregnant women and children and their offspring and so that needs uh, a small change, uh, a little change in the uh, way they do things and the, how they deliver care. So uh, that's what we've been working on from in this training program. So um, when we started uh, designing uh, th this whole intervention, uh, we found our main problem uh, had to do with implementation gaps. In 2005, we had uh, our health reform Chile with six change areas, but uh, there were only five laws. Sorry, um, I, I think I may have some unstable connection. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear yes. you perfectly. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. Okay, so uh, it, this health reform had six change areas, but only five laws uh, that uh, enabled change. And uh, the health reform said that the heart of the reform was this family medicine approach in primary care, installing this family, family medicine approach. Uh, but it had no associated law and resources. So it was just in the paper. So that's our first implementation gap. How can we implement this model of care with no resources allocated? And our second implementation gap uh, has to do with how can we transfer all the knowledge uh, that has been gained in the last uh, 20 to 30 years in, in all the early childhood development area, how we can transfer now we lost her. Trainer, are there? That, transfer that knowledge to primary uh, care. Practice. So knowing that we uh, started working to address that gap, that gap and we created this program infantile MASEP stands for uh, Dr. Trinidad, mm -hmm. you're cutting You might want to turn off your camera. Yeah. And we can, and yes, we, can, gonna... just... we can do the same if you want. Maybe okay. to put less stress on uh your connection. Yes, sorry. I'm at my primary care facility, which is in a very underserved area. So sometimes internet does not work that well. Um, I don't know if you heard this, the, the central tenets of our intervention, um, but uh, the intervention is a transdisciplinary team-based care with emphasis and collaboration. It's uh, our emphasis is put in delivering care by at a, by a health team with someone coordinating care, but um, that person that coordinates care uh, works along with all other professionals to uh, in terms of uh, satisfying the patient's needs. Uh, our main uh, purpose is to support families for healthy development and trajectories, and uh, the provision of services is a, uh, it's according to the detected risks. We are providing some surveys and questionnaires that uh, allow us to uh, detect in a more sensitive way uh, the different risks, but we are also aiming to um, to address those risks with a, a strengths-based approach. And uh, our main in in intervention in this, um, in this strategy is a clinical and administrative case management strategy to improve the efficiency in the use of service. We have a cohort design with a progressive implementation. We're starting with pregnant women and then we are going to, uh, the design will continue with the uh, strategy to deliver care to their newborn babies and then um, growing up with them. And uh, we're starting this in three primary care facilities yeah, as a it's a pilot implementation so this is a complex change because it's it needs 
uh, to to ha uh, a change to happen, and we need to go from fragmentation to comprehensiveness, from the uh, an approach based on problems and diagnosis to approach based on strengths and resources, and uh, we need to change from. Uh, always working on our agenda to set and um, put the, the our emphasis, our focus in the patient's agenda. And this needs uh, changes in the knowledge, in the skills, in the competences, roles, and activities that are, that are already installed in primary care. So for this, we need a training program that can improve these, uh, all these areas. Yeah, so that's what we designed. Uh, we design a training program for capacity building in primary care. Uh, we need a knowledge integration from the different professionals that would be involved in delivering care for this population. And we also needed the acquisition of new skills and competences uh, because um, there, there, uh, there was going to be a change in the roles and uh, how did uh, how they they delivered care to our population. So uh, this is a practice change. Um, uh, we need like to install some new lens in the for changing the way they see their patients, and that's what we uh, you know, looked uh, to to um, to improve with our program. So we designed a training program with three modules. Uh, the first module was a short one. It was uh, it only consisted of video capsules. It was a uh, delivered in an LMS platform, and it was uh, directed to all health facility staff. Um, the second module was uh, directed uh, to uh, uh, everyone at the, prim at the primary care facilities the, uh, had to complete module one, but then uh, according to their roles in the intervention, they had to also complete module two and module three. Yeah. Module three was only completed by midwives and social workers. Module two by midwives, social workers, but also team leaders and psychologists. And module one, module one by everyone. And the topics uh, uh, that uh, were uh, delivered in these modules were about comprehensive and person-centered model of care, uh, different approaches for maternal and infant care, and uh, clinical case management in in terms of this model. So this is an example of uh, how our LMS platform looked like. Uh, there were the three uh, different courses and uh, you can see the video capsules. Uh, we also had some take home messages that could be downloaded so for them to keep them on hand. And uh, we had formative evaluations um, for uh, them to uh, get to know how much they had learned and, and like give them the, the ability to track their progress. Um, and this is, these are some pictures of the workshops we delivered uh, during the training program. Um, we delivered three workshops, one about communicational skills, another one uh, for about the solution focused approach, and another one about uh, skills for motivational interviewing. So our main results uh, to this date, um, mainly our participants were mainly women aged 25 to 35 years in uh, most of them, and uh, who had been working at our primary care centers for more than five years, and uh, some a very uh, uh, another group for less than a year. Uh -huh. um, the topics covered in the training program were this in that are in this word cloud, but mainly patient-centered care, um, some of the central tenets of the strategy and some important uh, topics about uh, child development, toxic stress, resiliency, uh, trauma-informed care, nurturing care, etc. And uh, the survey response rate, uh, as you can see the module, the The first module, which was delivered to all primary care health uh, facility workers, um, and we had a very good um, response rate because the survey was embedded in the same uh, platform. But in the other two modules, the survey was um, you had to to go into a link for a Google form a survey. So uh, that's why we had a, a lower survey response rate. And uh, but we can see. Uh, in the results that we had statistical difference significantly statistic, uh, stati uh, significantly statistic differences um, 
in the in the three modules uh, regarding knowledge and uh, confidence in modules two and three, and uh, we also received feedback about uh, that the program was of good quality. It has a a very a good organization suggested that we uh, may improve in the platform because they had some trouble um, connecting to the platform and down, downloading the material and things like that. Um, they suggested that they needed more practical exercises, not just like watching these capsules and answered, answering to some questions and uh, a better timing car coordination because it was very difficult to allocate protected time uh, for them to complete the, the training program. Um, so uh, uh, there and there were many difficulties also because of the uh, they are very uh, stressed in terms of they have to uh, deliver care to lots of patients and they have to uh, complete a lot of. Um, surveys and uh, like uh, paperwork and things like that so uh, sometimes these uh, training programs seem more like something extra uh, in their work overload and uh, uh, it's difficult for them to find uh, the space to to do this like uh, in peace yeah <laughs> Um, so um, this capacity building initiative was successful and, uh, and successfully announced the staff training uh, and it had uh, significant improvements in knowledge and confidence uh, and it offered a cost effective and flexible solution for uh, capacity building in primary care. But uh, one of the main difficulties and challenges uh, was allocating protected time for the program completion because as I was saying before, they face multiple demands uh, every day. So it's difficult for them to allocate time. So our future directions and challenges are, um, first of all, um, we, have to, we, we have to design a midterm follow-up to assess changes in clinical practice. We are seeing now like the, the immediate changes in knowledge and in their uh, perceptions and attitudes towards uh, all this change, but we have to see if this if uh, delivering all this training program has impact in their practice. Um, we are also um, going to deliver some more workshops for pre uh, that, like, they, like can enable them to have more practical application of what they learned, and because now they. Uh, they will be um, uh, delivering care in this new model, so uh, they will have some uh, practice themselves, so um, they can join these workshops with like, uh, uh, not in a so very theory theoretical ways, they can bring up some clinical cases they've been involved or things like that. Um, we are also uh, thinking of uh, designing some advanced courses for uh, members of the team who require more, uh, more advanced competences for delivering uh, care. And uh, we are also working on improvements in the LMS platform uh, for um, um, like uh, um, uh, uh, in accor according to the feedback we received that they had some difficulties during the execution of the training program. So that's it. Um, I'm happy to receive your questions, comments, um, concerns. Um, thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Trinidad. Maybe you could stop sharing. That worked out despite the poor connection. Uh, and it reminds me to thank you for joining yeah. from such a long distance away. It was a real treat to finally meet you in person in Montreal a few weeks ago. I'm also noting the presence of Dr. Iksan from Indonesia, and I'm noting that it's 1.30 a.m. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we have some time to take some clarification questions around Dr. Trinidad's project, perhaps, before... Oh, Dr. Iksan first. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank to David, uh, to the Best Rural Center and University of Ottawa that make this uh, sharing uh, even uh, possible to us. Uh, I'm very interested in the topic, so I wake up and then I join in the sure. middle of the night. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to join uh, uh, tonight. Uh, actually, this, uh, what you, uh, Trinidad, just uh, present, that uh, very interests us. and. Uh, I think it's uh, 
most likely applicable also in my place and we need it for sure uh, so i can wait to to see uh, uh, the result of uh, at the end of this project because it's still ongoing project uh, i have actually one question david and one suggestion uh, for trinidad uh, uh, one question would be um, because uh, this training program uh, for capacity building consists of three modules, and I, I saw that uh, uh, first module two hours and the second module six hours, even third module is 14 hours. How do you manage uh, uh, the time? Because uh, in my place, uh, each of health workforce are very busy with their daily activity. So how do you manage to, to, to apply this uh, training to all of uh, the health workforce in your place? Uh, because this is, uh, I think it's not an easy task to do. Uh, that's my question. And then I have a, a little bit, a little uh, suggestion that I saw uh, your platform you just present. Uh, I think it will uh, make a, uh, uh, even better if you provide uh, one slot or one segment of the application that allow the participant to submit suggestion uh, uh, to 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 you as, as the one who organized this uh, uh, platform. For example, they can submit uh, 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 content of relevance or additional skill that needed by certain uh, how workforce uh, uh, and also for module, uh, improvement. So, if the you have you you provide a a place uh, for each participant that uh, allow them to uh, uh, give suggestion after each module, that will be good to improve the the module. That's just a little suggestion. So, mm -hmm. one question and one suggestion. That's all, David. Thank you. Thanks, Ixan. Thank you very much. Um, Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, well, we provided that space for suggestion. That's where they uh, said that they had this trouble with the platform and that they needed more time and all those things. But um, maybe we can put that uh, in the same platform, not in the survey, because we, we I think. Can you hear me? I, I'm unstable again. We, we got <laughs> the gist turn of it. Off my Okay, uh, that we, we can uh, put that in the same, um, they are able to, to just provide feedback directly in the platform because for the survey, they have to go to another link and so on. And uh, regarding change, um, because uh, uh, it's difficult to allocate that much time for uh, very uh, required and uh, uh, with a long uh, overload of work and uh, professionals. So um, this is as this is part of a complex change in health institutions. We've been working from I don't know one year before in uh, change management within the institution within the primary care facilities. So. Um, we had a long time to plan this, and uh, from very early uh, in this uh, relationship between our innovation units and the primary care facilities, we stated them that we needed uh, to allocate this time for the training program, but that 14-hour uh, course uh, would be uh, it was 20 uh, 14 hours in total uh it would be only for the midwives and nurses that uh, are the like the ones that are providing the more like substantial part of the intervention yeah so uh as we had this uh stepped um step uh, intervention in terms of uh, the the module one was just for, uh, it was just two hours long, but it was for all uh, professionals in the facility. And, and uh, then it was uh, in raising the complexity of the intervention of the, of the training. Um, we had um, 
all the, the stakeholders and the directives of our primary care facilities very convinced that this was uh, necessary for implementing the 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 change like not provide this training yeah so uh i i think that the most important thing in here is like you have to uh convince and uh and uh be very clever in in uh presenting like the a need for a change to your stakeholders and your primary care facility directors uh, so that they can buy in to the change and then say, okay, this uh, is worth it, so I can allocate this time uh, with these uh, professionals. At least here in Chile, we, uh, in terms of our um, work contract, I'm for, um, for training improvement, yeah? So uh, we, we can, uh, partially um, used that uh, uh, that time, but uh, also there was some other hours allocated that were not part of that uh, like uh, legal protected time. Mm -hmm. hmm. Muchas gracias, Trini. This is great. I must say I'm really enjoying the fact that know. we're across. I don't know if you heard me well yes, or if it was very <laughs> like. It was good. Uh, I was just saying I'm really enjoying the fact that we're across six time zones, at least four or five different languages. This is exactly what we want from these rounds. Leah, did you have your hand up? Yeah, uh, there's someone uh, from the audience here. The only person. <laughs> I'd like to ask. Go ahead, both. Jen. So uh, thank you very much for the uh, presentation. And it's a question, and I hope you don't mind reflecting a bit historically. About 20 years ago, we worked with the Universidad Católica with the School of Nursing um, and Primary Care to look at how, uh, and maternal child health, how do people who are very vulnerable make decisions to seek care, primary care? And then how do those caregivers respond to that seeking of care and developing pathways? And it was called Decisiones. And, he, and initially it was for nursing and it went through all the schools of nursing in Chile and training. And then the family doc said, hang on, the patients are coming to us with this ability to want to make decisions on their own. And we've always made the decisions. How do we adjust to this new empowerment? And I'm just wondering if there's any, um, vestiges of that at all in any of the work you're doing in terms of, of uh, institutional memory on, on uh, helping community population-centered kind of approaches to making decisions for care, or is it just gone by the wayside of the dodo bird? Well, thank you very much for that question. That's uh, something we've been trying to address and uh, it's very difficult as I, in our pre-graduate training uh, we're not very well trained in like empowering patients and uh, uh, shared decision making and all those kind of things and patients are also not used to it so uh, when sometimes you provide space for uh, some shared decision making they Say no, uh, like uh, you tell me. <laughs> what what would you do? Yeah. Uh, like, it's no. Let's talk about it and uh, let's. Uh, um, so it's yeah, kind of, so, it's, it uh, we worked uh, in this. Sorry. I yeah, it might be an opportunity to regroup on that, and maybe it's old, but it's still very relevant. It seems in terms of. Uh, not just waiting until your kid's too sick to get to the care, but also empowerment around the decision making. It was uh, uh, with, with all the schools of nursing, people did their PhDs on it. And then we worked with Cornavaca in Mexico. So it might we might be able to resurrect some of the tools that you might, might like to look at maybe. Uh, I can talk to David about that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. Muchas gracias, um, Trinidad. I, yeah, I I hear you like a uh, little breaking up, but uh, from what I caught, uh, from what I get from you, uh, it's uh, 
we we're, we tried to address that we uh, in the workshops uh we we had some of uh we we tried working with uh, our primary care workers in like my agenda versus patient's agenda yeah and uh, adjusting to patient's agenda but it's clearly uh, a huge challenge and uh if you have some experience in that area i would be glad to receive your insights and uh to read about your work because it's uh, one of our main challenges like to like uh to bring uh this uh co-responsibility in care and uh, all these topics about shared decision making and uh and incorporating patients agenda so <clears throat> thank you very much. follow up with david then okay okay thank you thank you so much very stimulating discussion je voudrais présenter notre prochaine boursière prof la Euh, vient du Madagascar, comme on a entendu, mais elle est à la ville de Québec. Donc, le, sa connexion devrait être euh, parfaite. Prof Lala, c'est à vous. Et je vous, I also would like to acknowledge in the audience Dr. Sumit Sodi, who's our research director at the Besser Center, who's very intimately involved in these fellowships, and colleagues from the Université Laval. Uh, again, because of our tripartite uh, relationship, we're able to move further along together. Prof Lala, c'est à vous. Oui, merci. Bonjour à tous. Euh, bonjour, je suis euh, Lala Soif Maramarzotouf, donc euh, de Madagascar. Je suis dermatologue, mais également interniste, et je tiens à remercier David et toute l'équipe, la Fondation des Sourds, de m'avoir permis de, de présenter aujourd'hui, c'est la toute première fois de ma participation, pour vous parler de de la bourse Bessrour qui est un, euh, un pardon qui est un tremplin pour euh, la médecine familiale à Madagascar donc c'est le plan que nous allons suivre pour ma présentation premièrement donc je vais vous présenter mon pays Madagascar et un euh, Madagascar est un une grande île c'est pas euh, les slides ça ne suit pas Oh, ok, pardon. Alors, Madagascar est une grande île euh, d'environ 580 000 km2 située dans le canal de Mozambique, à la partie sud-est de l'Afrique. Nous sommes une population d'environ 30 millions d'habitants et 60% des malgaches sont des ruraux et 40% vivent en milieu urbain. Et cette grande île est divisée en 23 euh, régions administratives. Donc, nous sommes composés des 18 ethnies, donc un peuple qui est accueillant et souriant, comme vous voyez ici. Et les principales occupations des malgaches, comme nous sommes de, des ruraux, donc ce sont des travails au champ, en forêt, et même en zone urbaine, la grande majorité n'ont pas les moyens et effectuent les petits métiers. Donc, c'est un pays qui est en voie de développement avec un PNB par habitant estimé à 125, 525 dollars. Et euh, la partie pour la santé n'est que 4,79% de, de cette somme-là. Le système de santé n'arrive pas à couvrir les besoins de santé de la population. Et il y a euh, comme... Euh, il y a donc... Euh, euh, une incapacité à, à voir les indicateurs de santé et l'espérance le, de vie est de 63,6% pour euh, les malgaches et la mortalité infantile est très élevée, estimée à 45 pour 1000 naissances environ. Nous, les médecins malgaches sont très peu nombreux, environ 0,20 docteurs pour 1000 habitants. Et dans les centres de santé de base, seulement 40% de ces centres sont occupés par des médecins généralistes. Et dans les 60% des cas, ce sont les infirmières ou les agents de santé qui s'occupent de ces centres-là. Et ces centres sont aussi de difficiles d'accès dans les zones reculées de Madagascar. Donc, pardon. pour le système de santé chez nous, il est divisé en deux grandes parties. 
il y a euh, le, le secteur public et puis il y a euh, le secteur privé ou libéral. Donc le secteur public est le secteur public est donc géré par le ministère de la santé et il n'y a pas de prise en charge de la santé à Madagascar et dans le secteur public la consultation et l'hospitalisation sont gratuites mais les patients doivent payer les médicaments et les examens paraclinique et euh, l'assurance santé est très chère dans notre pays. Je vais vous montrer donc l'organisation de ce système de santé publique comme ce que nous voyons ici sur cette pyramide. Nous avons des centres hospitaliers universitaires euh, dans, les grandes, dans les grandes régions, aux environs de 22 centres. Puis il y a les centres hospitaliers régionaux, donc dans les régions, puis les centres hospitaliers de district et les centres de santé de base qui sont éparpillés partout sur Madagascar et seulement 40% sont pris en charge par des médecins. Et enfin, nous avons des sites communautaires dans la population qui ont surtout un rôle de prévention. Et donc, je vous montre ici les photos de ces centres de santé qui, qui ne sont pas équipés, qui ne sont pas assez équipés, mais qui méritent d'être améliorés. Et nous voyons ici aussi des images euh, des, qui ne sont pas des médecins, ce sont des infirmières, agents de santé, et qui prennent en charge les patients dans ces zones réculées. Pour euh, la formation médicale, c'est un point aussi à améliorer. Euh, la formation médicale pour devenir médecin généraliste à Madagascar est de 8 ans environ. Donc, il y a la formation de la première année à la sixième année qui est faite de stages hospitaliers et des cours magistraux. Et il y a ce qu'on appelle le troisième cycle cours, la septième année et la huitième année, où les étudiants font des stages hospitaliers et puis ils vont présenter une thèse à la fin de la huitième année pour avoir le diplôme de médecin généraliste. Et s'ils si veulent continuer une carrière plus universitaire, donc, c'est un autre parti, une autre partie à le concours national de l'internat qualifiant comme le Residana ici, où c'est limité en nombre aux environs de 60 par an et c'est une formation longue de 4 ans pour devenir médecin spécialiste. Et bien sûr, si le médecin veut continuer encore plus pour devenir chef de clinique et pour devenir professeur, c'est encore plus de 4 longues années d'études. Ce que nous avons constaté, c'est qu'il y a vraiment des lacunes importantes dans la prise en charge des, des patients et tant dans le nombre des médecins qui vont prendre en charge le problème de compétences, mais également dans la formation médicale. D'où la nécessité, à notre avis, de faire des réformes dans la formation initiale de la première année à la huitième année, mais surtout du troisième cycle court qui les permet de devenir médecins généralistes. Et nous avons donc pris conscience que c'est la médecine de famille qui est une réponse adaptée à ces besoins-là. Donc, nous avons comme objectif de créer une médecine de première ligne forte, mais il nous faut des ressources très importantes donc, pour développer cette famille, médecine de famille à Madagascar qui est un concept tout à, fait, tout à fait nouveau. Et il nous faut aussi l'appui politique. Il faut que cet appui politique soit important pour pouvoir euh, former ces, ce qu'on appelle les super médecins pour pouvoir prendre en charge les patients dans les zones réculées. Et nous avons créé ce qu'on appelle un comité de pilotage avec la faculté de médecine d'Antanarive, l'université de Laval qui nous soutient depuis 2015 et le ministère de la santé publique. Et fort heureusement, actuellement, nous avons la Banque mondiale qui nous soutient par le biais d'un projet appelé PPSP. Et l'objectif de ce projet, en fait, c'est de renforcer les capacités des pays à faire face aux pandémies. Et nous avons trouvé une ressource dans ce projet pour avancer dans le sens de euh, médecine familiale. Et c'est ainsi qu'il faut un alignement fort de la politique, de la faculté, de la partenariat, mais surtout du financement euh, dans, le, dans la création de la médecine familiale. Et c'est dans ce contexte que le, le centre Bessour prend une importance capitale et aussi 
nous avons bénéficié du support et de l'appui de l'Université de Laval depuis 2015. Et c'est ainsi que, le, comme je, je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, ayant euh, obtenu euh, la, la Bourse Pessour pour cette année, la Bourse Pessour est un véritable tremplin donc, parmi les moyens à mobiliser dans la création de cette médecine familiale à Madagascar. Et notre objectif dans ce sens est de former des médecins ayant des connaissances médicales, chirurgicales, obstétricales et de santé publique plus poussées et en soins de première ligne et qui pourront être un support aux médecins généralistes dans chaque région. Et des étapes sont à suivre. Nous sommes au début de ces étapes. La première étape, c'est d'agir et plaidoyer pour la reconnaissance de la, de la médecine familiale comme une un véritable spécialité ou discipline et développer un programme de formation en médecine familiale et d'intégrer cette spécialité dans euh, l'interne qualifiant qui est le système de spécialisation à Madagascar l'équivalent des résidences ici au Québec, et aussi, à la fin, de pouvoir créer un département de médecine familiale dans la faculté de médecine d'Antarnarie. Ainsi, la Bourse Pessrour m'a permis de faire une formation de sur un stage à l'Université de Laval à Québec, et les objectifs à atteindre ce que, ce que j'ai fait en fait lors de mon stage, c'est d'acquérir les connaissances et les compétences ainsi que le leadership pour développer le cursus de médecine familiale et communautaire à Madagascar ainsi que le département universitaire de cette, cette nouvelle discipline et bien sûr de pouvoir le diriger ultérieurement mais aussi de développer des relations internationales qui est très très importante et des réseautés pour trouver les moyens techniques et financiers pour ce grand projet, parce que c'est le plus important dans la création des projets. J'ai vécu vécu en immersion donc, dans le système de santé basé sur les soins de santé primaire qui existe ici au Canada, et m'immerger dans ce système de santé qui est l'une des plus performants au monde. Et aussi, j'ai comme objectif de voir et analyser le fonctionnement des cliniques et des médecines familiales et afin de prendre pour modèle et pouvoir adapter cela aux réalités de Madagascar. Donc, sur le plan pédagogique, j'ai appris des méthodes de pédagogie de la santé que on va pouvoir adapter ultérieurement au contexte de Madagascar. Et en matière de gouvernance facultaire, euh, je me suis imprégnée, j'ai étudié les méthodes de gouvernance facultaire canadienne pour pouvoir les appliquer au sein de la future euh, formation en médecine familiale à Madagascar. Je vous montre juste quelques photos. Donc, la réunion du département de médecine familiale à l'Université de Laval sur la photo de gauche et la photo de droite, j'ai assisté à des staffs euh, au sein des cliniques de médecine familiale, ce qu'on appelle les GMFU au Québec. Donc, ça a été très formatrice, c'était très intéressant. Ça m'a permis d'ouvrir les yeux sur euh, ce qu'est vraiment la médecine familiale et déjà de les réfléchir sur ce que on peut faire ce qu'on peut adapter dans le contexte qui existe chez nous à Madagascar avec les peu de moyens. Je vous montre juste le poster qui a, a été présenté lors de la congrès de la médecine, euh, forum de médecine familiale qui a gagné heureusement le deuxième prix ex aequo de Dr Paris, euh, Patrick Tchégué. Et les belles photos avec l'équipe de Bessrour ici que j'ai l'honneur et le plaisir d'intégrer depuis cette année. Alors, quels sont les résultats attendus? C'est très important de voir donc des perspectives. C'est que déjà pour l'année prochaine, nous allons faire les démarches pour qu'une reconnaissance nationale peut être établie, parce que c'est quand même vraiment une démarche importante à faire au sein de euh, euh, la communauté médicale à Madagascar. Et dans deux ans, 
nous espérons mettre en place le département de médecine familiale et communautaire au sein de notre faculté de médecine et nous, nous espérons développer euh, le, euh, le programme, en fait, le cursus de cette médecine familiale. Et dans deux ans, à l'automne 2025-2027, nous espérons avoir la première cohorte de médecine de résidence dans médecine familiale au sein de notre faculté de médecine. Voilà. Pour conclure, donc, la, la médecine familiale qui est un nouveau concept, qui est tout nouveau chez nous, est un challenge à gagner, mais nous allons gagner. Alors, il y a pour cela, je le répète encore, il faut un alignement fort de la politique, faculté de médecine et des partenariats dans un pays en développement qui n'a pas les moyens. Il nous faut de l'aide, il nous faut la collaboration avec nos partenaires et, et surtout donc ce financement qui est très important à avoir. Et c'est pour cela que euh, la, la bourse Pessrour est un tremplin. C'est un tout début, mais vraiment un grand début, un grand tremplin pour développer cette spécialité dans notre pays. Alors, pour finir, je vous remercie de m'avoir écouté. Je vous montre des photos de d'aller des baobabs à Madagascar, euh, qui est unique au monde, et aussi les lémuriens, euh, qui sont aussi quand même une petite famille au sein de la famille de Madagascar. Je vous remercie. Thank you. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Merci. Prof. Lala. Quelle excellente présentation. What an engaging presentation. Euh, C'est un grand plaisir de travailler avec toi, avec l'équipe AU Laval, et Je suis certain qu'on va y arriver ensemble. It's easy to take things for granted. The concept of super docs is a really great one. And the fact that still we think around 15% of countries around the world don't have the concept of family medicine also gives us pause. So thank you very much. We have time for questions in either language, English ou en français. I believe, uh, Patricia, you have your hand raised. Go ahead. Yes. Thank you very much. Greetings, everyone. And David, nice to see you again. Thank you for the link. Nice to see you. This is this is hot off the press. Dr. Patricia is our third fellow. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Patricia, go 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 ahead, please. Thank you, Dr. Lala, for that wonderful presentation. And thank you for highlighting the unequivocal need for family medicine in Madagascar. It was quite enlightening. However, I have one question. In your conclusion, you stated that the Besrao grant is to aid in developing family and community medicine in Madagascar. I'm just I just want to inquire if um there is already an established community medicine and you are planning to establish family medicine or under community medicine or family medicine as a standalone department in Madagascar. Thank you. Flala, vous avez compris la question? Euh, elle m'a demandé, en fait, euh, oui. si j'ai bien compris. Oui. Si dans, dans le concept de la croissance des capacités, Dr. Pat se demande s'il y a déjà un programme de santé communautaire ou santé publique avec lequel vous allez travailler. Actuellement, le euh, concept de santé publique, je n'ai pas... Alors, je suis intégrée dans divers programmes, mais... Je ne suis pas impliquée à fond dans ces euh, programmes de santé publique, mais en tant que expert externe. Et c'est la bourse Pestro en fait qui m'a permis de vraiment m'intégrer dans ce concept de médecine familiale et de voir avec ce que j'ai eu comme expérience de quelle manière on peut les intégrer dans le, la santé publique à Madagascar parce que La santé publique à Madagascar, quand j'ai analysé la médecine familiale quand je suis arrivée ici, 
il y a des différences, vraiment des différences. La santé publique chez nous, c'est un peu la santé publique administrative où il faut mmh. atteindre les, euh, euh, les, comment dirais-je ça, les besoins de l'OMS, les objectifs de l'OMS ou les, les ob objectifs, les chiffres. Alors que dans la médecine familiale, il y a vraiment un souci de santé, de soins de première ligne. Donc, il y a quand même une différence entre la santé publique, proprement dite, ce qui est pratiqué chez nous, et la médecine familiale. Donc, je, suis, je me situe entre les deux pour pouvoir, après, analyser et comment faire pour réjo faire rejoindre les deux. Et c'est pour cela qu'il faut la volonté politique et il faut savoir euh, convaincre euh, les, la communauté médicale, mais également la politique chez nous, pour intégrer ce que vraiment cette médecine familiale. Voilà. Merci beaucoup. Prof Lala is stating that um, there is a public health or community health program, residency program. It's a rather bureaucratic one. Uh, there isn't a lot of front-facing care. Uh, And perhaps it's not that different, the lack of integration from uh, here in Canada. Uh, when we did the FMVAC study that I showed at the outset, uh, you know, some of our research team from overseas could not understand the research question. What do you mean you don't work with public health colleagues? They couldn't believe it. And so sometimes when we only exist in our own ether, uh, we fail to see gaps in our own systems. And so Prof. Lala intends to uh, bridge those gaps in her own context, and we will learn from her. And that's co-learning and co-creation. Merci beaucoup. Uh, Dr. Pat, thank you for the question. Great to see you from Nigeria. And Dr. Pat will be our third fellow, and she's very interested in adolescent health, which, of course, uh, we started with Trinidad's presentation. Trinidad, you have a question. Go ahead. You're next. Thank you, David. Sorry, Lala, I do not speak French, but <laughs> um, how did you manage to get buy-in from the authorities from your country and from the university um, for building this uh, family medicine residency? Because most of the times it's difficult to, to get people to uh, promote family medicine. Yeah? And when they have money, they prefer um, to spend it in, I don't know, Uh, other specialists or buying uh, CTs and uh, MRIs and those kinds of technologies and not investing in family medicine. So how did you manage to get that buy-in? Voilà, comment avez-vous fait le plaidoyer? Comment avez-vous convaincu les décideurs? Alors, euh, oui. Nous sommes au tout début, au tout début de, du processus, au tout début. Les décideurs sont encore à convaincre. Ce qui est bien dans notre contexte, c'est que euh, j ai, j ai, je suis euh, interniste et j'ai déjà travaillé beaucoup avec euh, le ministère de la Santé dans certains euh, projets. Et euh, il faut, euh, comment dirais-je ça, euh, savoir les convaincre de façon diplomatique et leur euh, montrer l'importance de, de ce que c'est que la, la vraie médecine familiale. Ce qui est le, le plus important aussi, c'est que le ministère de la Santé, actuellement, est impliqué dans le système avec le projet PPSP. Et euh, c'est par à travers ce projet, donc, qu'ils ont trouvé que euh, pour avoir vraiment, c'est un peu euh, technique, mais pour avoir vraiment des impacts au niveau mondial pour le, le projet, il faut que les professeurs, les euh, enseignants en médecine, la faculté de médecine, soient impliqués dans la formation des médecins. Et ça, c'est un point très fort qui nous a précédés dans le plaidoyer pour, euh, le, au, au sein du ministère de la Santé, euh, au sein des autorités. Et il a eu donc... Euh, la dernière fois, hein, une visite de délégation de Madagascar au Québec, récemment, où un, le directeur général du ministère de la Santé a été de la délégation. Et déjà, c'est un grand, grand, un grand pas de fait pour le plaidoyer. 
Et c'est un grand début. Et c'est, ça va encore euh, continuer. Et euh, d'une, euh, d'une autre part aussi, comme euh, euh, j'ai quand même un peu beaucoup travaillé avec le ministère de la Santé, peut-être pas. Euh, j'ai beaucoup travaillé avec, au sein de plusieurs euh, projets. Et de cette manière aussi, euh, j'ai, euh, il a cette expérience qui va me permettre de m'avancer dans le plaidoyer et avoir des, des preuves tangibles pour euh, les convaincre que la médecine familiale est d'une utilité importante, surtout euh, que l'objectif du projet TPSP, comme euh, ce que j'ai dit tout à l'heure, c'est de renforcer la capacité des pays à faire face aux pandémies. Et le point le plus important dans ce renforcement, c'est vraiment la formation de... Euh, de, de, des agents de santé, la formation de médecins pour euh, cela. Voilà. Merci beaucoup. Uh, we're at the top of the hour. Uh, there's one more question. I want to thank everyone for joining. Those who have to leave, I hope we can have another three minutes or so. Trini, uh, Prof. Lala was uh, underlining the importance of a consistent approach, a multi-sectoral approach, and a tripartite approach with support from Canada and, of course, the World Bank. Uh, I think consistency and interdisciplinarity are key, hearing it from all kinds of different directions. A consistent message is surely the way to go. Jenny has a uh, comment or question. Jenny is our dear colleague from Université Laval, and perhaps we will end with her comment. Thank you, Jenny. Oui, bonjour. Je m'excuse, je suis en bonjour. train de marcher. En fait, je voulais juste... Euh, euh, bonjour, je voulais renchérir sur euh, ce que la a ajouté, que depuis 2018, cette réflexion-là est quand même en cours à Madagascar et qu'en 2020, quand on, juste avant la pandémie, on avait... Le président venait d'annoncer qu'il souhaitait ce renforcement de la première ligne et ce nom de grand médecin, c'est le ministre de la Santé lui-même qui l'a proposé, ainsi que la fonction des médecins de famille qui pourrait être en appui dans chaque mmh. région aux médecins généralistes, avec une mmh. formation qui est un peu plus, qui, qui est adaptée aux besoins de Madagascar. Donc, c'est une formation avec des compétences avancées en en chirurgie d'urgence euh, et en obstétrique pour des césariennes, des choses comme ça. Donc, je pense qu'il y a quand même un bout de chemin de fait à ce niveau-là. Oui. Et c'est très encourageant. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Jenny. Merci. <laughs> it's great to see you. Clearly, it's colder in Quebec City than it is in Ottawa. And oui. certainly in Chile, Indonesia, uh, Nigeria and Madagascar. So that wraps up our hour. Uh, unless there are any burning questions from the room, Léa. Um, I guess not. Uh, no questions. <laughs> no questions anymore. Thanks everyone for joining. Thanks for joining. Jenny, vas-y. Oh, excusez. Okay. Euh, non, non, je ne sais pas ce qui s'est passé. Euh, je, je vous ai perdu. Tout a coupé. Euh, okay. Donc, euh, OK. We, we, heard your comment about the, we heard your comment about the importance of a needs assessment and, uh, you know, really, really helping partners find solutions, not proposing solutions unilaterally. So thank you very much. I think we picked up on many interesting themes this hour, and we look forward to the next uh, rounds, uh, which I believe in our are in March, if I'm not mistaken, Leah. Indeed. We'll have a session on February. Yeah. Please keep an eye on your emails. And thank you very much. This was very engaging. Thank you, David. Thank you, Clay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Nice to thank see you. Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy holidays and happy new year. Happy everyone. holidays to all. Merry, merry everything. Bye bye. Bye bye. Happy holidays. Bye.